Hello, and welcome to SCAD Style. My name is Terrence Williams, Jr., and I am a performing arts student here at SCAD. And today, it is my pleasure to introduce graphic designer Annie Atkins. Annie is the inspired designer behind graphics for films, including The Box Trolls, Bridge of Spies, and The Grand Budapest Hotel. She started off her career working in Ireland on the BBC show, The Tudors, and as the industry became more acquainted with her work, she was brought in to work on larger and larger projects, ultimately leading her to work with visionary directors Steven Spielberg and Wes Anderson. Leading today's conversation is SCAD Chair of Advertising and Graphic Design, Duke Greenhill. Please join me in welcoming our SCAD style guests. Welcome, welcome everyone. Uh, thank you, Terrence. Wonderful job. Uh, uh, he did such a great job. I would only add one thing because Jeff Goldblum is one of my favorite actors, and I, I have to throw this in there, Annie. Jeff Goldblum says, Annie is a master craftswoman. She makes the unreal seem hyper real, and the real seem more supremely alive. Not bad, coming from someone like Jeff Goldblum. <laughs> Annie recently wrote uh, the book Designing Graphic Props for Filmmaking. Uh, you can see from the dog ears and the torn... Uh, little pieces of paper I put in there that I, I rather enjoyed it. Uh, and there's nothing wrong with a, a book plug, right? So those in the audience uh, should already have received a copy. Uh, those of you joining us virtually should run out and get one right now. Uh, so shall we dive right in, Annie? Yeah, thank you. Why not, right? And thank you, Terrence, as well. Um, yeah, that's a lovely quote from Jeff Goldblum. I remember when... Um, I remember when my book editor said to me, oh, we could ask Jeff Goldblum for, for a quote about the book, you know, because you've worked with him. And I thought, well, yeah, I've worked on the same film as him. I haven't exactly like worked in, like we, we haven't sat side by side in an office, you know, <laughs> he's, not, he's not one of my colleagues. Um, but she wrote to him and he, he read the book and he, and he gave us that lovely, lovely quote. So yeah, thanks to him as well. Yeah, and he's he's wonderful. Why wouldn't you want it from him? Um, so starting off, Annie, the by far the, the question I receive most frequently from people who perhaps are not graphic designers uh, is what is graphic design? And, and those of us who are involved in graphic design know um, that that's a difficult question to answer um, and somewhat unique to each designer. How would you define graphic design? Well, when I'm defining it for my film work, I always say that in its absolute most basic terms, it's anything with um, text on it, anything with a picture on it, or anything with pattern on it. Um, when you're working on a movie, those will be the props that the graphic designer is responsible for. So it could be something as simple as like a tiny handwritten little note, but because it has lettering on it, that's going to be your responsibility to, to produce and to design a, an appropriate handwriting for for that character. Wonderful. Uh, how did you start in film? Oh, well, I started out in advertising um, because I studied graphic design in London years ago, um, back around the millennium. Um, and it was just very like everybody was going into advertising that's where we were all kind of shepherded towards um and i understand it because that's where all the work was that's where all the clients are that's where all the money is you know um so we all did internships in london ad agencies and i just never considered anything else really um i went off to to an ad agency in reykjavik uh mccann erickson and i worked there for four years and at first I was very excited by it. Um, it was very cool, you know, like to work in a big ad agency, like they had like cool things, like asymmetrical haircuts and leather sofas and a pool table, yeah. Um, so I was thrilled with myself. I thought it was the bee's knees. Um, but then I just found that design-wise, I just was not, I, I just wasn't very good at it. Like, first of all, I it, I was working in Reykjavik in Iceland, so their, their style was that very beautiful, clean, Scandinavian style. Um, you know, like a lot of digital typesetting, muted tones, very cool, very sophisticated, very lovely. But 
it, it, it just wasn't wasn't my style you know like I'm I'm someone who uses a lot of paints these days um uh and also I, I just I just felt like I wasn't very good at it I was doing the same thing over and over again and I decided that design wasn't for me and I quit and I went off I went back to film school back to school to study filmmaking and I decided that I was going to learn how to operate a camera you know light a set write a script these were the things that I thought filmmaking was all about and of course when I started my degree in filmmaking I learned um that there's this whole other world of design and that's design for the screen and it was just something that I had never considered before um so that was a, a whole new world opened up to me then fascinating I, I spent some time in film as well and I don't know the answer to the question I'm about to ask you who is your primary collaborator uh, when you're designing for props? Is it the art director? Is it production designer? Who do you report to? Who, who's who's the person that you collaborate with? It, it depends on the movie and it depends who hires me. Um, so for example, something like the Grand Budapest Hotel, I was really working very closely with Wes Anderson, the director, because he has a very hands-on approach to the design in his movies. Um, so we would exchange tens of emails every day about any given prop or set piece um but that's unusual like you wouldn't really usually talk to the director about a piece unless they had very specific ideas about the graphic on it and they they generally don't the the, the directors are generally caught up with the actors and the script and the characters and and making all the interactions work um so when i worked for spielberg on uh uh, a Cold War spy thriller, Bridge of Spies. You know, I didn't, I didn't talk to him at all. I think we had one interaction over a newspaper that I'd made, and the rest of the time, I was really just dealing with the production designer, Adam Stockhausen, who I work with on lots of films. Uh, he works for Wes Anderson and Spielberg. So, on that, it was more between me and the production designer. The production designer is the person who designs the overall look of the movie. Okay, like they're they're in charge of of what this film is going to look like um but then on another show like i did a show in savannah last year or the year before last actually remotely i was doing it from dublin um i was working exclusively for the prop master because it was the prop master that had hired me to make some special 18th century posters um and i really just interacted by email with him and his assistant um, and then other movies, like you'll work for the set decorator. The set decorator is the person who dresses the sets. Um, who else have I worked for? Costume, the costume designer. On, on Wes Anderson movies, actually, I sometimes work with the costume designers to do the lettering for the uniforms and things. So it really, it really depends, yeah, on, the, on who's who. Cool. I'm curious. Do you have a preference? You mentioned, you know, Wes Anderson and, and Steven Spielberg, two obviously very successful directors. One... Uh, as you say, very much sort of an auteur uh, involved in creating a very specific look uh, for the film, that being Anderson and then Spielberg, who is Spielberg. Uh, do you have a preference of the type of film you work on, big Hollywood tentpole versus uh, indie with a sort of auteur director? No, I don't have a preference. I've, I've started having preferences for different periods. Um, for me... Honestly, I don't really care what the script is like. I just want to know the time it's set in and the location it's set in because my work is so involved in the look of certain times and places that I'll get really excited if some, someone contacts me about like a mid-century film or a French film um, or a Victorian TV series because they're the, they're the kind of decades that I love designing for because... Uh, just just something about the hand lettering of those times um, I really love or the technology they use. Like I love making fake telegrams and you really get a lot of telegrams in in movies that are set in the 1950s, you know. Um, so for me, that's the first thing I think about when I get a call about a job. Um, I think like with the difference between Wes Anderson and Steven Spielberg, um, yes, Wes is definitely much more hands on with graphics and things. I think that can be a really nice way to work and then your next job is going to be completely different and you'll be working in a completely different way and I think I think there's there's kind of pluses and minuses to to all ways of working. Yeah. You mentioned a uh, mid-century Victorian anyone who knows me knows that 
mid mod is is my to me the bee's knees. Uh, so I get that, but is there also an element of almost time travel involved for you? Why is it the period uh, that's that's most interesting to you when you're considering a job? Well, do you think maybe? I mean, I'm thinking off the top of my head here, but I, I mentioned earlier that I didn't really I didn't really gel with that beautiful digital Scandinavian layout design that I had that I was supposed to be good at it when I started my career, you know, so maybe it's a reaction against that. And maybe I'm just like constantly now looking for periods like from a pre digital age, um, where I can use paint, and I can use my my um, Victorian dipping pen or my feather quill or, you know, my typewriter or whatever it is. Um, I, I do like using analog tools um i'm better at it i'm better at using analog tools than i am at work digitally i have to work digitally all the time i mean i like to talk about analog tools and my typewriter but of course every time i finish a piece i scan it in and then bring it into photoshop and alter it and that you know um it's not like i'm a total luddite uh but um but there, there's there's something very appealing to me about the handcrafted look of things you know I like the look of things that aren't digitally aligned that there isn't a button where you just go click and go center align and it's just perfectly centered you know or the kerning is perfect um I think if you look at any of my pieces like the kerning is always slightly off um but I like to think it's supposed to be like that. I'm with you there's a certain beauty in imperfection for for lack of a better word and you know as makers I think many of us are uh, and as a society, are, are sort of craving a return uh, to the analog, uh, uh, a move away from the digital. Uh, is your job really as exciting as it sounds? Um, I th I think so. Yeah, uh, I think I think it's I think it can be very tiring, and a lot of people in film will will come across very jaded. Um, but honestly, deep down, I think we're all ex still extremely excited about working on a movie. Like there's nothing, there's nothing like sitting down in a cinema and watching a movie that you've worked on and seeing these pieces up on the cinema screen. I don't know why it's so exciting. I don't know why that's more exciting to me than picking up a book in a bookshop that I might've done some work on, you know, there's, there's just something about the movies that is exciting. It's, it's exciting to see actors walking around the set, you know, um, like I've never, I've never really got used to that. My friend, I, I don't work on set a lot. I work, I tend to work in the office in the art department or uh, from my studio here in Dublin. Um, but I have friends who work on set, you know, they're working on the camera crew or, or whatever. And they seem very at ease with actors. You know, they're, they're, they're very cool with the cast because they're so used to being around them all the time. But every time I see a famous person walk past, I'm like following them with my eyes, you know. <laughs> I'm the same way. I like to think I'm above being starstruck. But the truth is, when I, when I see a celebrity on the inside, I'm geeking out. Um, yeah. You're um, wildly prolific, honestly. Uh, and as Robin Miller said, uh, you are are doing your job wrong if the audience is focusing on the props. So it's sort of a, not a catch-22, but an interesting dynamic to be trying to create something that does not draw attention, or at least the wrong kind of attention. Uh, talk to us about how the work you do is uh, required to, to be that way, to not have the audience focus on it, but to have it drive the narrative, drive the picture. Yeah, I mean, I think it has to be largely subliminal. Um, like, you, you don't want the audience to be... The, the, the thing is, with, with graphic props especially, like over, say, furniture props or dressing props, the thing with graphic props is they usually have lettering on them. And it's human nature that we want to read what lettering says, you know? So if we see a sign in the background of a movie that we're watching our eye will naturally be drawn to it and we'll try and decode it and re read what it says. And for that reason, it means that I think graphics, um, they, they, they almost have a little bit of a higher standard because they really have to pass the scrutiny of the audience because people are going to be analysing them, you know. Um, there's nothing worse than seeing some error, some graphic error in the background or some spelling mistake or something. Um, 
But at the same time, you know, we, we, want, we want the graphics to blend in seamlessly into the background so that we can tell the story with them without distracting the audience from the story. It's a, it's a delicate balance, you know, and I think that's why these things need to be authentic. Um, they can't look like, I, I, I want to say they can't look like props, but of course they are props. Um, but they can't look like what people might imagine props to look like, okay? They have to look like real artifacts from the time. Even even if you're, you're working on something with quite a heightened sense of, of realism, like Mm -hmm. kind of children's fantasy adventure or you know a Wes Anderson movie where where the graphics and all the colors and everything are, are really beefed up they still have to fit into that world I think I, I use the word authentic a lot um, when I'm talking to my students and I also use the word realistic a lot but I, I don't think I mean realistic um, I think there's a difference between authentic uh, authenticity and realism like we're not hell bent on realism in our in our film work because we're creating a story. We're we're dealing with drama, but we are totally concerned with authenticity. It has to fit into the world around it, even if that world that we're creating isn't necessarily realistic. Yes, yeah, real to the to the picture to the world of the movie. Um, mm. It's interesting. In a you know, I find that in my graphic design students, in my work in industry, ego is probably the largest hurdle to great collaboration, to great work. Film is notorious for being a, an industry full, uh, rife with ego. And yet your job requires you almost to, to not be seen. Is there a part of you that wishes uh, there was more limelight on your work? Um, no, you know, it's funny. I, 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 don't, I don't feel disappointed when I don't see a piece that I've worked on in a movie because you quite often don't you know something will just not be shot on at all or something will be shot on but it's in the blurry background or it's upside down or an actor's got his hand over the wine bottle label or whatever it is you know chances are your work is not going to be seen um but I don't I don't feel disappointment when that happens I think I just expect it but what I do feel is absolute thrill when you do see something, you know, when you when you get like what we call like a hero shot or, or a close up on on something that you've made that lasts like a second. I think a second of screen time is quite a long time to focus on any prop. You know, that's thrilling. You know, that's really exciting. So, yeah, you, you kind of you have to leave your, your ego at the door, really. And also the other thing with working in film is it's such a machine. It's such a, like, you're just a tiny cog in the wheel, like a graphic designer in the art department and the art department in the much bigger filmmaking process. We're like an army, you know, we're all soldiers and we all just have to do our one little thing really well. And then the machine works. Yes. Yes. And as you say, it's the movies and there's something just wonderful about, about working in film. I remember the first, job I had on a movie. I was an undergrad and I was fetching lunch for the actors. Uh, the Alamo was shooting outside of Austin, Texas. And there was one actor, I won't throw him under the bus, who regularly threw the sandwich at me for, for getting it wrong. And I told my mom about it and she said, doesn't that upset you? I said, no, I'm working in movies. Yeah. You know, um, it's amazing what you'll put up with, right? <laughs> yes. The hours, the the egos, etc. But it's a wonderful, wonderful business. Um, in the book, you talk a good bit about the research that you do, and it's it's clear from your work that you do a great deal of research uh, to prepare, particularly for the period pieces that you you mentioned you love so much. Talk to me about your your research process and and why you feel it's so necessary to to nail the work. Yeah, so if I'm working on a bigger movie, there will be a researcher on board, which is amazing because they know everything about every period and they'll get you, they'll get you photos. Like I remember on the last uh, French film I worked on, I really needed to see what bus stop signs in rural France looked like in like 1952 or something. And I just couldn't find it. And I contacted the researcher and immediately she had like 10 photographs of bus stop signs from the, from the 50s. Um, so a lot of the time you're looking for these these things, like some, some things are easy to research. So if, if I'm on a smaller job and I have to do my own research, um, you know, some, some things are relatively easy to find. Like there's plenty of archives and 
beautiful websites about lovely chocolate boxes, you know. Um, there's fewer sources uh, for finding old, I don't know, bus tickets. Um, some of the things we need to find are so tricky, like, what, what's a good example? Uh, okay, so, so what did somebody's office no notice board look like in the 1930s? Um, there just isn't, a, there just isn't photographs of these things online, you know, and certainly if there are photos, they're not tagged office notebook, notice board 1930s, you know, you just have to find some office pictures and hope there's a notice board in the background so you can see how people laid them out and what kind of things people stuck up on them. Um, so, I mean, obviously looking online is a, a great resource um, and I don't know, really don't know how graphic designers and film worked without the internet, um, but they did, like it was recently as 20 years ago. Um, but I always say it's not the, it can be the first stop, but it's not the last stop. So yes, we can do a quick Google image search and look on various websites and things. Um, but sometimes you really need to go to a museum, go to the library, um, you know, go to an auction, buy, buy pieces. It's really important to have physical tactile pieces because it's very different looking at a picture of a telegram on a screen to how it is actually holding a telegram in your hands you know like the first time i ever designed a telegram i didn't know how big they were you know were they these like tiny little things or are they quite big things we don't use them anymore so it's impossible to say and of course you can look them up on pinterest but nobody's going to give you dimensions you know <laughs> nobody's going to nobody's going to show you what's on the back um so i also do a lot of shopping for rubbish online i go to ebay and i buy things i order i order scraps of things from collectors um where else do i get things oh like in in old photo albums from my family home in the attic like look in your grandmother's attic you know look to see inside books what were people using as bookmarks 50 years ago that's where you'll find a bus ticket from 1963 you know um yeah it's just it's really important to understand the scale of things and the texture of things and and what was printed on the reverse of any given thing as well very cool thank you uh, at scad we sort of look at things often through a, a framework of head heart and hand right the the making with your hands the the research component for you might might be the head part uh but the heart part uh is abundantly clear in your work what is it that inspires you um well i suppose i take my inspiration immediately from the the reference material that i collect but then i have to develop it like i, I find like when i'm working with my workshop students they often come from a place where they feel they have to be completely original to make something of value. Whereas in film, it's kind of the opposite. You have to be able to copy to make something of value for a film set. So it's like it's more like forgery than creativity. You have to be able to forge a document. You know, you have to be able to study a document exactly, understand how all the different components were made, and um, imitate it convincingly. You know. Um, but but I think my works my workshop students are sometimes hesitant because they feel like copying is cheating somehow you know because that they're, they're they, they've they've learned to try and be original at all times um, so first of all I have to get originality out of them and then I have to explain that you know you will develop these pieces like you'll start off with an inspiration piece of a piece of reference material and you'll copy it as convincingly as you can but you will have to develop it because it it has to suit the script the story at hand the plot the genre um the overall look of the set the colors of the set um the character that you're designing for so i think by the time you've finished a piece it can look very different to how it started but you've still kept that kind of core authenticity to it Yes. Uh, it's interesting. You've mentioned teaching several times. Uh, teaching was a, you know, a calling that I couldn't avoid. I eventually was going to have to make myself uh, make my way there. And I knew it. Uh, how did you get into teaching and why do you find it rewarding? Yeah, I, n I never saw myself as a teacher. Uh, my mum was an art teacher 
and I never considered it at all um, up until a few years ago. I just got so many emails from people, like because graphic design for film isn't really a taught subject. You know, you can study film design in general. Um, and I think in some graphic design schools, they might teach a little bit of filmmaking things as well. Um, but it's not like you can go and do a degree in graphic design for filmmaking. Um, so I was getting all these emails from, from design students and young graphic designers who wanted to, to change, jump ship, uh, to the film world. Um, just asking if I was giving any classes on it or if there were any books about it. And there weren't any books, like not not specifically about the a, a broad picture of graphic design for filmmaking, and nobody seemed to be teaching it. So I just started doing it myself, and I was traveling around and giving workshops in different places. Um, I actually had a semi plan to do a workshop in Savannah last year, actually, but of course, couldn't happen. Um, one day, one day I'll come and do one. Um, and yeah, then I started running workshops from my studio and I just loved it. I absolutely loved it because people who work in film are tired and they are a bit jaded. And, <laughs> you know, it's it's a shame because it's an exciting industry. And the workshop students who come to my studio to learn are, are thrilled by it. And it's it, it makes me excited by it again, you know, because you really dive deep into into the process and not just the process of actual prop making, but also just talking about what life is like on a film set. Um, all of a sudden, it feels exciting to me again, and um, I really look forward to my workshops now. I haven't I haven't actually done one in so long because of the pandemic, but I hope now I'll be able to start them up again later this year or next year, maybe. And I really look forward to having having students back with me. Well, we look forward to having your workshop in Savannah. Yeah, so we'll, yeah we'll figure out a way to make that happen. Um, and in fact, we're going to do a, a virtual one after this, so we're looking forward yeah. to that. I'm sort of fascinated with the, your fascination with with period pieces. So I want to ask you one more question about that. Hopefully, not belaboring the point, uh, and then we'll queue up that uh, the work that you brought us to look at. Um, look at some of your work. But what's the oldest? Uh, film you've done, not the oldest in terms of its production date, but in terms of its time period? Um, it probably is also the oldest production date because my very first film job was on the TV series The Tudors, mm. which was 15th century, about King Henry VIII. Um, so I kind of went from, from advertising to film school to Henry VIII, you know, and that was quite a shock because I didn't know what I was doing um, but I had to learn very quickly and there was a lot of stained glass um, royal scrolls a lot of calligraphy I, I actually hired hired a calligrapher for most of that job um, um, oh no sorry I have done I have done a, a, an older period oh no sorry I've done a much older period since then uh, that, that was my first ye olde period and then after that, I did uh, a TV series about Camelot, um, the Knights of the Round Table. So that's a kind of a mythical time, but it, it was older again. Um, but I've also done the oldest period I've ever done was a pilot for a TV show about cavemen because they needed somebody to draw the hieroglyphics that were going to go up on the cave walls, you know. So th th this idea that, I, I mean, I think the term graphic design is a relatively modern term. I think it was coined in the 1920s, perhaps, you know, but that doesn't mean that graphic art somehow hasn't existed previously. So it's quite, it's quite interesting that you can be a graphic designer and, and end up um, drawing, pr pretending to be a caveman for the day, basically. Yes, it is fascinating. You know, you mentioned graphic design dating back to Time immemorial, the dawn of man, mankind, uh, and story. You know, two of the the primary things we we study at SCAD have been around since since there were people, and it's it's kind of wild. Let's look at some of Annie's work and let you walk us through it a little bit. Okay. So that's just my book cover. Um, yeah. So I I, uh, I I wrote a book all about this stuff. Um, a couple of years ago now, it was published last year. 
and that was great it was really amazing to be able to put out all this down into words and show pictures from all the different movies that I'd worked on and explain some of the process you know um and then I designed the book cover as well which was great because I'd never designed a real book cover before I'd only ever designed fake book covers for movies so all of a sudden designing something real was very exciting to me you know um and then some of the things that I show in the book um they're kind of like close-ups of props that you just don't see in the film because in the film, unless it's like a Wes Anderson movie where he he very much puts things in the center of the screen and it's this all it, you know you get a real proper close up on it. Most of the work that I do is not like that. Most of the work I have to go into the same amount of detail, but you never ever ever get that 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 real close up shot. Um, but I, I, that's not to say that the work on any film is not that detailed like we actually still go into the same level of detail because we're we're mostly designing for I suppose we're mostly designing for the cast you know it's for when the actors arrive on set in the morning and they look through the props that they're going to be working with and they look at the set pieces we really want to transport them to a different time and a place we want to help them like get to this place where they really they're really feeling like they're embodying that time um so the level of detail is always really high, but in my book, you actually get to see some of some of the things that we've made and you get to read the text on the pieces, like whether that's, you know, a, a CIA document with fingerprint sample or a telegram or an antique passport or cinema tickets or, or calligraphy or whatever it is, you know, you actually you, you actually can see these things in close up detail, because I think I think people assume that we probably just use like gobbledygook you know <laughs> like Laura Mipsum and we don't we actually never do that I think you'd have to be working on a very very I want to say you'd have to be working on a very very low budget show to get away with that but even then like I've worked on low budget shows and we never used Laura Mipsum text um so I think I think the standard is is always there actually in, in graphics um and you know any show that you've worked on uh, that you've watched on netflix in the last couple of weeks will have had at least one two full-time graphic designers working on it and everybody's everybody's like concentrating on this fine level of detail the uh, real quick any the the pieces that that uh, i mean i'm sure some of the the copy for example in the telegram uh, in that dossier are relevant to the narrative, come from the narrative. But I'm sure there's also moments where you get to make up what a telegram might say, or uh, how do you decide on those little mini stories? Do you sort of imbue them with your own fantasies? Where do they come from? Yeah, I, I, I always feel like being a graphic designer in film, you have to be a writer as well, because mm -hmm. you have to create content for the pieces that you make. Now, sometimes you'll get content from the script. Uh, sometimes you'll get content from the director, like Wes Anderson famously writes all the text for his graphics. Um, sometimes the screen the screenwriter will supply, say, a magazine article for you that they've written in the style of the period. But most of the time, most of the time, nobody is supplying this stuff, um, only like the real hero pieces. Um, you have to create a lot of content for like newspaper articles and telegrams and royal letters and whatever it is. And you have to write in the style of the period. And that can be very, very tricky because writing styles change hugely from decade to decade and place to place, you know. Like the voice of a New York Times journalist in the 1970s is very different to the voice of a modern English journalist. Um, so it can be difficult and it can be time consuming. And what I usually find happens is that early on in the production, some trainee or runner in the art department will show a little bit of skill in language and writing and I'll nab them. And for the rest of the show, they're writing fake text for me, pretending to be certain characters. Um, I had a brilliant assistant uh, a couple of years ago, Mairead, and she just showed such flair for this. Um, and she wrote so many fake fake things for me. It was great. Um, I, think, I think the trick to it is 
again it's forgery okay so it's 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 like it's like plagiarizing a school essay right you find a piece of literature that you're going to rip off and you change all the names you change all the dates you swap all the paragraphs around you know you make the opening line a little bit different and you just change it enough so it's going to get past legal clearance okay and then you're keeping the essence of it and you're keeping the tone of voice right and everything very cool fascinating please continue okay um so more forgery um you know i was talking earlier about realism and authenticity and um sometimes you know even if you're doing something that's quite comic like this is a you know it's, it's a three dollar bill like everyone knows they don't exist um and it's jeff goldblum's face uh but we try and make it as realistic as possible as authentic as possible um uh trying to match every single little detail, like whether it's the gouache pattern in the background and the typography and the stamps. Um, I mean, I'll often, you know, I try, I, I try to use real analog materials uh, and tools when I can. So if I need to do a rubber stamp, I don't create it digitally. I actually go to the rubber stamp shop around the corner and I get a proper stamp made up and th that helps with, with those kind of details. Very these cool. were these were banknotes actually not for a movie i was going to i got them all i got a, thousands of them printed for the book launch in new york uh because jeff goldblum had written the little blurb for the book um and i was going to hand out banknotes as a little keepsake for people who came along for to hear the reading uh but of course it all got cancelled so now i have sacks and sacks of fake three dollar bills in my studio with jeff goldblum's face on them i don't know what i'm gonna do with them <laughs> that's hilarious you can send some to me yeah um, <laughs> I'll send you would find them as funny as i do uh, yeah. Just yeah, he actually <laughs> signed a few of them and I'm, uh, those ones i'm going to frame and i'm going to auction them off for charity um, <laughs> good yes yeah. um and that's your advertising background coming in there finding ways to to market that book yeah. um we got a few minutes before we go to Q and A from the audience, um, so let's look at a few more. But but maybe your your favorite few that remain. Okay, yeah. I mean, these are just examples. It's examples of um, lettering. You know, we're often trying to recreate letterpress posters. Um, I, I do do these digitally. I use fonts for these, but then I do a lot of texturing and making the type a little bit offset and things. And then also a lot of hand lettering like drawing signage for the backgrounds. These pieces would all have been drawn by hand um, because I don't want them to look like they were, at, they've ever seen a font because of course in the 1800s, it, it, it would have been designed with a pencil and paper. Um, more lettering examples. This is just a project I did last year for the pandemic, another charity thing to raise money for a hospice. Um, again, I'm avoiding using digital fonts wherever possible. And then this is just, this is not my work. I just want to show you this because it's one of my favorite reference images. And this is the kind of thing that I mean when I say finding authentic references are so difficult to come by. Like, because imagine if you had to design graphic signage, pricing signage for a sandwich shop in 1970s England. It's very difficult to imagine what a sandwich shop at that time would have looked like unless you have a reference of it and I just think the lettering on these signs is so beautiful because it's obvious that the shopkeepers done it they, they've done it themselves but they've done it with real care you know and that's a very tricky balance to achieve to step out of your shoes as a designer and into the shoes of a shopkeeper who's trying to make very nice lettering yeah and also I just love the way the sandwiches are all stacked up on each other like that looks look, looks so covid -y now <laughs> It does. And to your point, uh, putting yourself into the shoes of a shopkeeper who's very thoughtful and careful with their lettering, but also not a professional. And so those those sort of imperfections, the, those beautiful imperfections come back into play. Yeah, exactly. And that's the kind of work you have to do all the time in film. Like you can't design as a designer. You have to design as the character. Of course. I mean, so sometimes things, sometimes you'll be creating things that were designed by a designer, like shop windows would have been painted by sign writing artists um but i think it's it's these pieces that are the, the really fun bits where you get where you get to stop being a designer for a day beautiful cool um thank you so much for that annie um 
We are now going to take a few questions from our audience. Uh, be sure to, uh, virtual audience, to type your questions into the chat. Uh, we'll do our best to get to all of the great questions. Um, those of you in our audience audience, we have uh, two wonderful people who will uh, be running the mics back and forth. So if you have a question, please raise your hand uh, and wait for a mic to get to you. Um, looking at the virtual questions, let's see what we have. Let's see. From uh, Shirley, does Annie have any advice for illustrators who want to break into and get involved in prop design for film? Yes, we're always looking for great film illustrators. And the best thing you can do is stop trying to develop any of your own style. It's so, it's so terrible to say, but what I've found as working as a graphic designer in film is you can't have a style because you are going to have to step into the shoes of so many different characters and so many different styles. So if you're putting a portfolio together, we really want to see examples where you have been a Victorian engraving artist, a copper plate artist, or like a 1950s airbrush artist, or, so, you know, look look for illustrations from different times and places and imitate them and try and try and nail that style because we're always looking for stuff that looks authentic from, from different times. It's interesting in that way you're almost an actor uh, when you're designing the props for films. You know, you can't, you have to take on the, uh, the character of the prop. Uh, it's not an Annie Atkins piece. It's whatever the prop is. Fascinating. Yeah. Um, from Sam. Does Annie have a favorite prop that she's made? Why is it her favorite? And was it shown in the final cut of the film? Hmm. I think, yeah, I think I do have a favorite prop. It's probably the pink book that opens the Grand Budapest Hotel. Yes. You know, the way the movie is like a story within a story and there's a pink book and it says the Grand Budapest Hotel on the front. It's very unusual to design a prop that has the name of the movie on it as well so that's something that i really treasure and i have a second copy of that that i brought home with me and i have that here in my studio and it's beautiful and in a way it's the machine behind the film narrative i mean it's almost as if the the film springs from a prop which is unusual and, and wonderful for you um we have a question from the audience have a question? yes um what is the hardest project that you work on the hardest prop the hardest project Oh, the hardest project. Um, you know, I think all projects are hard in their own way. Um, I mean, let me see. What was the hardest? Um, I mean, I, I suppose Grand Budapest was was tricky for me because it was my first feature film. Um, before that, I'd only ever done TV. I'd done one feature, but it was an animated feature. So it was my first live action feature. So there was a lot to learn in terms of administration and, and, uh, and how to get things made, especially as well because I was living abroad. So it was also my first job that I did away. I went to Germany for the season to do it there. But I had a lot of amazing support on that film as well. Um, I had an amazing uh, uh, supporting graphic designer, Liliana Lambrieve, and Wes's crew are incredible. Like all his producers are really great to work with. So in that sense, it was fine. Um, I find I find certain periods hard. Like I find more modern periods hard. Oh, I know actually. I did a film. I think it was shot in Georgia. Um, some years ago, uh, an Ang Lee film, um, and that was set in 1994. And I found 1994 a really tricky period to work to because nothing's been archived yet. You know, the, the 90s haven't been fet fetishized quite yet. You know, they're beginning to be now, but at that point they hadn't been. And I didn't know what anything looked like. You know, what did a poster look like in 1994? I knew what a poster looked like in 1974, um, but not 1994. So I found that one really tricky. Very cool. I think it's a good sign that you have to to really search for a project that you found to be hard or difficult. It means you probably enjoy what you're doing most of the time. Uh, yes. 
Um, all of your projects have such unique styles and periods that you've been able to work in. Um, and I was just wondering, is that just the way that the projects have shown up? Have you always been offered jobs and unique stories and periods, or have you been selective about the jobs that you take? Yeah, I mean, I don't get offered very much contemporary work at all. Um, and I don't do very much contemporary work. It's just not my my cup of tea. Um, so I, I, I'd like to say I've been selective, but I haven't. Um, I just, you know, my first job was on the Tudors. So I suddenly became somebody in Ireland who does a lot of like medieval and ye olde work. And then I moved on to things like Grand Budapest. And, you know, so then I, I started to be an expert in like early 1900s work. Um, and after that, I just didn't, I didn't really do any contemporary stuff. Um, but I, I'm, I'm not, I'm not very selective. I usually, I usually do the first job that I get a call about. Um, you know, there's a kind of an unspoken rule in filmmaking that you take the first greenlit thing that comes your way because you don't know how long you'll be waiting for another movie, you know? Amen. Um, from Matt, hi, Annie. I'm studying branding, and I'd love to know, for some of the iconic work you've created, uh, like the Mendel's Box in, in Grand Budapest Hotel, how do you find a balance between creating something that feels authentic to the very distinct style of a director like Anderson but also stay true to your personal brand style, creating what you love to create. Uh, and he says he loves your work. You've sort of answered this, but it, it is a dif difficult balancing act, I imagine. What you think it should yeah. look like versus the director, et cetera. Yeah, I mean, I, I, actually, I actually pride myself on not having a style in my film work. So with film work, you really have to jump into the style of the movie itself and leave your own style at the door. Like I do, I do have, I do have a style now in my own kind of commercial work, like I sell prints of my artwork and I sometimes do branding for clients and, and they want to see my style in it. Um, but for film work, I, I'm really working to the period and, and the director. I think with Wes Anderson, it's very tricky because you're working to a different period, mm. often a completely fictitious place. So like in Grand Budapest, the, the country was Zubrovka, which is not real. And you're also working to Wes Anderson's style as well. So it is a tightrope and we were always looking for real references and then developing and developing and developing them. But I think, I mean, I, I, I hope I don't, don't bring my own style in, into, into movie work very often, but I'm, I'm, sure, I'm sure it creeps in. But usually I try to stay true to, to, to other, other aspects. Wonderful, thank you. Okay, we have time for two more questions. Great. Uh, hi, Annie. Um, I wanted to ask if you ever feel detached from creativity because you mentioned that you don't have a style of your own and then you um, end up forging and replicating a lot more than you do bring in your own insights. Yes, I think it's a great question. And the answer is yes, I do. And as thrilling as film is, and I don't want to put anybody off because it's a wonderful career, um, it, 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 it is a lot of forgery. Um, and you are often just working to try and imitate something else. And that's why it's really precious to me to be able to have time on my own work between projects. And also, you know, don't worry, like if you work in the movies, you will have time between projects because there'll be weeks where you're just waiting for the phone to ring for another job. And that's when I work on my own art and, you know, I develop my own look and I, and I do things that are fun to me. And I think that that's something that's really important to me. Fascinating. Good question. Um, I think this is a great question to conclude on. Uh, the mission of SCAD, of course, is ultimately to get our creatives a job in the field that they they love and have studied. Uh, and Julie asks, what kind of portfolio projects would you consider essential uh, for landing a job as a graphic prop designer in the film industry? This is something I talk to my workshop students about a lot, and I always set them a task at the end of every workshop to do as homework. And that is to go away and choose a character from fiction or, or from history, um, a character that you really love or that you're really interested in, and design a series of props for that character. Okay, and 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 that will take you to a very different time and place. And design the props, but also make the props. So don't just do your layouts in Photoshop or whatever, or even just painting or, or whatever it is, you know, print them, make them, cut them, fold them, stick them. If it's a cigarette box, fill it with real cigarettes, 
photograph it, um, think about the whole scene and build up your portfolio that way. Great answer. Uh, again, thank you so very much, Annie. It's been wonderful speaking with you. Uh, thank you, audience. For those of you who uh, are attending Annie's masterclass, which follows this, please hang around. Uh, we're going to take a short break between that and right now, but we will be back. And for those of you who are not attending the masterclass, uh, please join us at our next SCAD style event starting right here at 2 p.m. Thank you all very much. And thank you again, Annie. It's been wonderful. Thank you so much. And thanks for the great questions.